Hello, I'm the Red Monk, and for my school, my class, I have to do this PowerPoint presentation on an airplane crash, and I'm pretty darn proud of it, so I'll throw it up on the channel, and it's an airplane crash PowerPoint presentation for American Eagle Flight 4184. The presentation is called ICE. Now, What's cool about this presentation is the teacher said you could perform it any day you want. So October 31st was opened and that was 25 years ago to the day of the crash. 25 years. It happened on October 31st, 1994 and I would be presenting October 31st, 2019, which is Halloween. So, yeah, let's get into it. Uh, 25 years ago to this very day, American Eagle 4184 is holding outside Chicago's airport. It's called O'Hare. It is an ATR 72212. It is holding 64 passengers, two pilots, and two attendants. Now, uh, hold is, is it's waiting to land, so it's literally just flying in circles, just waiting to get the clearance to land. It's to kill time. And uh, the flight is in a low pressure air mass. The ceiling is 1400 broken, overcast at 3000, and gusty winds at 20 knots, 20 miles per hour. And there's a light drizzle, and that is the weather report of a nearby airport. Uh, captain's name is uh, Orlando Arguliar. I'm butchering that. Uh, he's 29. And the first officer, the co-pilot, is a Jeffrey Galeno. I mean, I apologize if I butcher the name, but he's 30. And uh, between the two pilots, they have over 5,200 hours. And the crash has no survivors. And I have a funny picture of a dog you know, throughout the PowerPoint. And no disrespect, uh, a lot of people never got off of this flight. And that's a really sad thing. But uh, I thought I could be lighthearted and have some funny dog pictures. So here's where the flight is. If you look up here in the top left, that's Chicago. And literally, the Chicago airport's like just out of sight, and they're right at this intersection, just flying in a circle, waiting to get their clearance to land. And as you can see, uh, this is on the this is the actual hold right here. It's zoomed in. A bit, but you can see that's yeah, just a circle they're flying on that intersection. So I think a good way to learn about this flight is to look at the cockpit voice recording. And I th whatever the families thought, they did not release it, the audio, but there is it transcribed. So we were going to read that. And you really see just where they were during the flight. And it's amazing to think that these people were dead in 10 minutes. But... Uh, from the cabin, the captain says to the first officer, he says, hey, bro. In uh, the cockpit, uh, the first officer's flying the plane. He says, yeah. Captain responds with, getting busy with the ladies back here. <laughs> uh, the co-pilot says, oh. <laughs> he says, yeah. So if I don't make it up there within the next 15, 20 minutes, you know why. <laughs> co-pilot responds, okay, I'll, uh, when we get close to touchdown." I'll give you a ring. <laughs> and uh, Captain responds with, uh, there you go. I'll be up right now. Someone's in the bathroom. So so uh, the captain returns to the cockpit. He says, uh, you haven't heard any more from this chicken, this uh, controller chick, huh? It's not a word. Understand a definite be beyond 22 release time. <laughs> and the... Uh, there's a short pause. You know, they're waiting to get their clearance. Usually you wait for about 15 to 20 minutes. But uh, now the ACARS is a computer in the cockpit that records flight data and prints a report on request. So what the captain's doing is he's printing a data report from the flight. And he's going to go talk to the dispatcher with the information. He says, I'll be right back, okay? I'm going to talk to the company. The ATC controller chick comes in with uh, Eagle Flight 184 
descend and maintain 8,000. That's uh, 8,000 feet sea level. And uh, the co-pilot responds with uh, down to 8,000, Eagle Flight 184. A ATC is uh, Eagle Flight 184. Should be about uh, 10 minutes till you're cleared in. Thank you. And, uh, the captain comes back a short while after he's done talking to the company. He says, uh, are we out of the hold? A co-pilot responds with, uh, no, we're just going to 8,000. Okay. Uh, first officer says, uh, in, uh, 10 more minutes, she said. So now they're descending, and they, uh, overspeed the flaps. So they just, uh, that means they, when they started to drop down a bit, they just, they had the airspeed over the limit for the flaps extended. Uh, the captain says, uh, <laughs> I knew we'd do that. I'm trying to keep it at 180. Uh, 180 is airspeed that is uh, safe for the flaps to be extended on. So they put the flaps up, and uh, they hear a thumping sound from the fuselage. And the captain is, oh, the pa the plane uh, suddenly banks to the right forcefully, and the pilots just level it off, level it off, and the pilot, the plane banks to the right again forcefully with uh, entering a strong nose down uh, attitude. So basically they were just flying along and then all of a sudden when they took the flaps out, the plane just banked to the right and they tried to correct it and it just banked to the right again. And uh, the first officer says, uh, oh shit. And the plane starts to really roll. It's just out of nowhere the plane just started banking to the right. And it's starting to dive towards the ground, and it's picking up speed. And there's a safety chime that plays, uh, alerting the pilots of their sink rate, because they're really starting to speed towards the ground now. And uh, the captain says, mellow it out. And then the plane, then the plane is still continuing to bank to the right, and it actually goes upside down. And it does almost a full barrel roll. And once they do the full 360 they start to pull it out and they start getting the nose back up to get into a climb. The captain says, uh, nice and easy because they're starting to see the sky again. They're getting their nose up. And, you know, after it almost makes an entire 360, the plane impacts on its belly and the pilots were in the process of getting pitch. Now, what happened? You know, the plane just randomly banked to the right out of nowhere. Ice. Now, uh, super cold water droplets. Uh, they were flying in a low pressure system, which is a cold front. Super cold water droplets form as ice on the aircraft. So, the plane's in a cloud right now. And as they're flying along, there's uh, gobs of raindrops in the sky that splash along the wing and freeze. And that uh, disturbs the how the wings work. And uh, 181 was in the clouds of the cold front, which is a uh, breeding grounds for super cold water droplets. And all super cold water droplets do is make the wing unable to make lift because it distorts the airfoil and makes it uh, not work like a wing. It just makes it like a giant metal tube in the sky. So as the front of the wings uh, fly through the air, they hit these uh, water droplets and they freeze onto the leading edge, the front edge of the wing, and it uh, disrupts the smooth airflow and makes it so the wings can no longer produce lift. And uh, clear ice is ice you get from low pressure systems. It has uh, very few air bubbles. It's very heavy ice. And it disrupted both the right aileron hinges and the leading edge. The nose high attitude with flaps held during the hold caused ice to accumulate under the wings. The ATR was uh, later discovered to have limited boots which increased its susceptibility to icing. And uh, what boots are is across just the front of the wing there's these uh, pneumatic bags and you can just flip a button in the cockpit and it'll expand out the bags and it'll knock off all the ice. And 
An issue with the plane that was later discovered after this crash was that these boots on the front to get rid of the icing had a limited range, so it couldn't really get rid of the icing, as well as when they have flaps, as setting the flaps in, it makes the nose go higher, it makes the plane fly slower. So that uh, exposed the underside of the wing to icing as well, which is already out of the range of the boots. Now, uh, for the plane also banked to the right and almost did a full flip by the ice. It is important to realize that you know, the ice is the same, but the air lines are not, right? Because, you know, both wings were flying in the same cloud. They were both exposed to the same amount of ice. So why did ice favor one side? You know, both sides were flying in the same cloud. Uh, and this is because in a propeller-driven aircraft, the spin of the propeller does not create straightforward thrust. It creates a little left going thrust. It's called the left turning tendency, right? Because when the propeller spins, there's a few factors that make it push to the left and make the plane automatically turn to the left when the propeller spins. Now, uh, engineers know this and they uh, devised many ways uh, to compensate for the left turning tendency when they designed the aircraft. The one major thing they did to make it so the plane would turn back from the left turn it's getting from the propeller is to build the right aileron slightly up so it was, all, so it was always uh, generating slightly less lift than the left to counteract the left turning tendency. So the plane by itself is made to bank slightly so it banks into the left turning tendency and cancels it out. Now, uh, this is good, it fixes the left turning tendency, but the right aileron is located further up than the left. And when the plane is nose high, the right aileron hinge is more exposed to icing than the left. Therefore, it got iced over, which caused it to lock and made the plane lock in a bank and made it flip over. Sterile cockpit. Every time I look at this flight, I hear someone talk about the sterile cockpit. And what that is, is if you're coming in to land, you cannot have any conversation that doesn't involve the flight. It's called the sterile cockpit, which pretty much means you know you can't have a nice conversation about the last football game when you're coming in to land. It's called the sterile cockpit. And if you look at the CVR... <laughs> With uh, the captain getting busy with the ladies, you really wonder, you know, are they are they busting that regulation? <laughs> They're talking about uh, their fifteen to twenty minutes. Uh, so yeah, a lot of people say that. A lot of people say that they are violating the no chatting when they're coming to the land, as they were waiting to land, right? And they were totally fine. They weren't busting any regulations, right? The legal definition of the sterile cockpit regulation says for the purposes of this section critical phases of flight including all ground operations involving taxi takeoff and landing and all other operations conducted below 10,000 feet except for cruise flight now 184 was holding at 10,000 feet above the sea level the regulation below states below 10,000, meaning at or below 9,999. If you, this is, if you, you really see this, see it says 10,000 feet, below 10,000 feet. It doesn't say at or below 10,000 feet, it just says below 10,000 feet. And since they were at 10,000 feet, they were totally able to talk about whatever they wanted. In, uh, if you look even in the CVR, once they uh, descend to 8,000, they get ATC to go down to 8,000, which is below 10,000 feet. Their conversation only involves the flight. 
So they were totally fine in that respect. Now, of course, a plane is very expensive. And of course, they're going to go to court. The company's going to go to court. The families are going to go to court and get all the money they can. And what happened with the, the plane, the ATR, is it was actually inspected by the Frenchies. And the FAA signed it after the French written it down as safe. The Civil Aviation uh, for French in France, they were the ones who actually inspected it. So when it came to realize that the plane was vulnerable to banking to the right in icing conditions, even though it is certified for icing, the FEA could have just said, hey, they inspected it, it's their fault. And of course, the FAA was also blamed for their lack of oversight. And the, the, the Frenchies took the blood of the impact, but as well as the FAA, the the company that made the ATR also got a little bit of blame, but since the Frenchies inspected it for icing and signed it off for icing conditions, they were legally charged with it. And the plane was uh, the plane type was disallowed from flying in any icing conditions. And, you know, a few things that you could have looked at. And, of course, the pilots were, literally, they were doing everything right, and the plane was a thing that was screwed up. But there was a few things that the pilots could have done that could have really prevented this. You know, though the pilots never performed any improper actions, I believe some steps could have been taken. You know, the Flaps 15 setting, the thing that made them fly slower and had a nose-up attitude, made the bottom in the airload hinges exposed to icing. So when you're flying in icing conditions, you never put the flaps in, and it's just not a safe idea. They teach you that. And the underside of the wing got icing, yes. And the pilots thought the plane could handle ice. It was The plane was signed off to handle icing conditions. And uh, But being so close to the ground... They could have requested to hold where the ice and rain was not. That would have been much safer. Ice.